Hey everyone, it's Sarah Whiting here, Executive Director of St. John's Church Foundation, and today I'm excited to have as our special guest, Bert Dunkerley. Bert and I are going to have a conversation about Benedict Arnold and Arnold's raid on Richmond in January of 1781. You ready to talk traders? Sure. <laughs> well, before we get into the conversation, I want to introduce Bert to you all. Bert Dunkerley is an historian and award-winning author and speaker who is involved in historic preservation and research. He holds a degree in history from St. Vincent College and a master's in historic preservation from Middle Tennessee State University. He's worked at nine historic sites and has written 11 books on the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, and he's written over 20 articles. Uh, his research includes archaeology, colonial life, military history, and historic commemoration. Bert is currently a park ranger at the National uh, Richmond National Battlefield Park. He has visited over 400 battlefields and 700 historic sites worldwide. And we know Bert because he works right down the street from us. He works at Chimbo, Chimborazo. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just as a personal note, we love Bert. Bert's been a great friend to St. John's Church Foundation. He's partnered with us on many special events. He's given his own free time to volunteer. And of course, we are very excited that we partner every year in January with the National Park Service on our annual Arnold's Raid event. Most people know uh, St. John's as the place where Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, but they don't know about Benedict Arnold. Right. Um, Richmond is famous for its Civil War history, and that really overshadows its importance during the Revolution. And of course, St. John's is, is well known as the, the place where Henry gave the liberty or death speech, but Richmond experienced the revolution from start to finish. Mm. And one of the big events is Arnold coming to Richmond in 1781, late in the war. Uh, it had just become the, the capital of the state and the British capture it fairly easily. Yeah, so, so what was Arnold doing in Richmond? We got to talk about him and, and give a little bit of background on him. Mm -hmm. Arnold, and, and we forget because we, we tend to look at Arnold, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, knowing that he committed treason yeah. and what happens later. But early in the revolution, Arnold is one of Washington's best generals, very successful, very aggressive. Uh, Washington is personally close to Arnold. He trusts him a great deal. Arnold was wounded twice in combat. He felt that he was not promoted quickly compared to other officers. And he did have personal financial problems. At one point when he is recuperating, he is appointed as the military governor of Philadelphia. And it's at that point that he makes some questionable decisions. To be honest, they probably weren't illegal, but they were not ethical. And when that comes to light, uh, Arnold is exposed as someone who's uh, selfish and uh, in it for himself and not necessarily the cause. And all these things are building, his frustrations, his financial challenges, uh, his wife from a prominent Philadelphia family, uh, is a loyalist and so he makes arrangements he gets transferred to command west point the military uh, base there and he reaches out to the british and makes the offer to uh, sell west point uh, for a general's commission and a, a good chunk of change and uh, that goes through of course his, his British contact, John Andre, gets captured and is eventually hung. But Arnold barely uh, makes it over to the British lines and ends up serving the rest of the war for the British. Now, for the Americans, this is a, a pretty big blow. He was one of their more successful generals. Washington trusted him. Uh, I'm sure it really stung to have that, that close person turn on him. Washington at one point arranges for Arnold to be kidnapped out of British held New York. The plan fails, but they come close to getting him. They want him back. Mm. Uh, so wherever Arnold goes, the Americans are paying attention. If they have a chance to get him, 
they, they want to. How much do you think uh, of a role that uh, his, you mentioned his wife, Peggy Shipham, how much did she have um, in influencing him, do you think? I, th I think a great deal. And there's a good recent biography to talk about this. Uh, I think Arnold was at the point where he was frustrated and he was probably kind of borderline and, and her position might've been enough to push him over the edge. Huh. Uh, and another point that I'm just remembering is that Arnold was really not happy about the French Alliance. The French were the traditional enemies of the English colonies going back uh, decades through the, the French and Indian wars that were fought between the Canadians and the New England settlers. And of course, France is a Catholic nation. Mm. And so all those things were tied up in Arnold's thinking that he was really upset about the alliance with France. So what is going on right before he comes to Richmond? What's going on with the Revolutionary War? Uh, by 1780, and we're talking about the winter of 1780 into 81, the, the bulk of the fighting has shifted to the Carolinas. Uh, the British have an army under General Cornwallis operating in the Carolinas, and uh, the Americans are funneling supplies and troops down there. And that's an important thing to remember because Virginia has really drained itself of resources. Mm -hmm. Supplies and manpower are flowing down to the Carolinas. And by the time we get to 1780 and 81, Virginia is pretty well depleted of resources. And uh, the British recognize that Virginia is an important source of supply and any supplies from Pennsylvania or points north have to flow down through Virginia to get to the Carolinas. So Arnold is sent from British held New York. We've got to remember that New York City is in British hands for almost the whole war. And Arnold is sent down with a force to occupy the Chesapeake, set up a, a permanent station. And they do that at the end, December 30th of 1780 in Portsmouth. And from there, they can control that area. They can uh, interrupt the flow of supplies and they can raid and disrupt Virginia's war effort. And things move very quickly. Over the next couple of days after the new year turns, uh, the British will sail up the James River, they'll raid plantations along the way, and they'll eventually land at Westover and begin the land march to Richmond. Had the word gotten out to people in Richmond what's going on at that point? And so the, they were, the militia, the Richmond militia was able to sort of gather only, I think it was about 200 men at that point. To... Yeah, the, the Americans were not totally in the dark. They knew that the British had landed there and they knew the British were sailing up the river. They didn't know their intentions. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of criticism of Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson is the governor at this point a lot of criticism of his handling of this. As the British sail up the river, they're not sure what their objective is. Are they going to Petersburg? Are they going to Richmond? Are they going somewhere else? Is this just a small raid up and down the river? And so it's a couple of days into it that it becomes pretty obvious that they're headed, it's got to be either Richmond or Petersburg. And the call goes out for the local militia Again, remember a lot of Virginia's manpower is out of the state. And pretty frantically on January 4th, Jefferson starts to oversee the packing up of government documents, uh, the fledgling state government, which had only been in, in Richmond for a short time. And he oversees the packing up of supplies and, and materials, uh, military supplies. And they get a lot of them out, but not all of them. So, uh, so then Arnold comes down, uh, what, what is Route 5 now, more or less, and comes up right to Chimborazo. And what happens that day? Yeah, the British are marching up and they, they make camp at a place called Four Mile Creek, which is about where uh, today there's a, a park on the Capitol Bike Trail. It's about where 295 and Route 5 intersect. So in that vicinity, uh, the British camp. Uh, the local American militia who are from 
you know, Henrico and, and the surrounding areas. They think about trying to stop them there, but they decide to fall back to Chimborazo Hill, which is a very prominent hill on the east side of the, of the town. And just to give you a picture of Richmond, you know, the, the town extended from about modern day 17th to 25th streets. Mm. And it was pretty much concentrated in, in what we call Shaco Bottom, maybe 600 people. Main Street was the, the center of, of town, mostly wooden structures. Of course, the old stone house was there. Yeah. Uh, the church was the largest building in town. That's why the Virginia conventions were held there. So the Americans are kind of scrambling and the militia assembles on Chimborazo Hill where today the city park is. Somewhere along the crest, along the edge. And if, if you stand there today, it's the same scene. You can look out into the valley, you can see Route 5 coming in. Uh, just picture uh, about 1500 British troops marching down in would have been an impressive sight. Wow. So 1,500 troops, and he, he has his Hessians with him, right? Aren't the Hessians along? And you, do you want to talk about who the Hessians are? Sure. That's one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is there's so much variety. You know, we tend to think of the British all wore red and the Americans all wore blue, and uh, you know, things are not so cut and dry like that. Arnold's force is typical of, of what the British are operating with in America. They have a small number of British regular troops, red coats. They have uh, a, a unit called the Queen's Rangers. Those are loyalists mm -hmm. from the New York area. They're wearing green coats. They have Hessian riflemen who are called Jaegers. That's the German word for hunter. They wear green coats. They've got loyalist troops. So, you know, a lot of different colors and uniforms, a couple different languages being spoken. Wow. And the, uh, again, about the Hessians you asked about, there, there were other German troops in other, other places. Uh, they weren't all from Hesse. They were from other German states. Germany was not a unified country yet. We tend to for convenience, call them all Hessians, but they were from different parts of modern day Germany. So, so 1500 and then our guys. So we've got 200 of these militiamen. Before we get into the actual uh, action of the battle, yeah. um, Jefferson receives a letter. Uh, he's, he's fled west to Tuckahoe and um, then he crosses south of the river to the what's now modern day Midlothian area. And he gets a letter from Arnold. Arnold wants to ransom the city and Arnold demands supplies. And he writes that he wants things like molasses and sugar and sailcloth and other, other supplies and he'll pay half the value of them, half the current market value. <laughs> and Jefferson obviously refuses. And we have, hold it up here, maybe see this, in Arnold's handwriting, the letter, uh, this is in the Virginia Museum of History and Culture's collection, is just an interesting side note to the story. We also have, and I think this is really great to compare to a modern map, um, British Army engineers drew this map, and you can see the hills on the upper part here. They match perfectly if you look at a modern topographical map, Chimborazo Hill, Point out the church, because there's a little church yeah. right there. Main Street is, is running down here through the center. There are a cluster of buildings. Shaco Creek. Yep. Today, where Main Street Station is, is at 15th and Main. So it, it's kind of fun to, to match up the historic documents with the modern ground. It's, it's, and by it's the way, uh, a great source is Harry Ward's Richmond and the Revolution, uh, long out of print. But if you can find it at a used bookstore, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. Oh, great. that's great. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a great resource. Let's see. At this point, was it January 5th, 1781? Yeah. Here they come. The British are coming. They're coming up the hill. R200. What happens? It's hard to say, honestly. I think you read different, uh, different summaries of, of what happened. It's not 
it's not the level of a battle. I, I call it a skirmish. When Arnold looks up the hill, he uh, immediately recognizes it's a strong position. And he sends his Jaegers, his Hessian riflemen, around to be his right, the American left. And uh, if you can picture, if you're standing on Chimborazo Hill, the, the Hessian riflemen would have come around to try to encircle from the side. And they do that successfully. And then he sends some of his other troops straight up the hill. And the Americans fire a volley or two, probably a ragged volley. Um, and then they take off. They're gonna, yeah. What happens? He comes up the hill and he's coming right down our Broad Street now. Yeah, uh, obviously Broad Street was not there, at least in the way we know of it today. Might have been a wagon road or a trace or something, but uh, the troops who've gone up the hill will, will push the American militia to the west. The militia would flee uh, through what is now the Church Hill neighborhood, past the you know, St. John's Church, and uh, down the ravine where Shaco Bottom is, and up to the next hill, which was called Shaco Hill, which today is where the state capital is, was not there yet. Arnold sends another part of his force down, straight down Main Street. So they would have moved down past uh, where the old stone house is and all the historic structures that stood there. And they get to the end of what was then town and collect themselves. The American militia kept fleeing to the west and they'll eventually reorganize later not just the capital, but the, the other reason why Richmond is an important target is its, its industry and its supplies. So Arnold will dispatch some of his troops to go to the Westham Iron Foundry, which was located on Williams Island. And today that's uh, down below the, the Windsor Farms neighborhood along the river. Uh, it's, it's inaccessible today, but uh, the, the foundry produced all kinds of military supplies, including artillery and cannonballs and other things like that. The Americans have moved a lot of things out, but there were still a lot of things there, as well as the machinery and the, the tools and supplies. So the, it's a mixed force of, of Hessian and British troops, and they, they dump gunpowder into the river, effectively destroying it. They, they, destroy some cannons that are in the process of being manufactured, destroy a lot of other supplies, and then start to make their way back. As they make their way back in the evening, the American militia that's kind of collected on the outskirts of town starts to, I think, cautiously follow them. I don't want to say they drove them in. There is a historic marker uh, not too far from the Virginia Museum of History talks about Arnold's pickets being drawn in or driven in. I, don't, I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> but uh, the British and Hessian troops will regather in what's now Shaco Bottom. Hmm. And uh, there's accounts of them breaking into stores of liquor. They're going to bed down. I'm sure they must have been exhausted. They've been up. They marched a couple miles, fought a skirmish marched a couple more miles. It's been a long day. Uh, Arnold is going to stay at a place called Galt's Tavern, which was at the corner of 19th and Main Street. Uh, long gone. It was torn down in the 1850s. It was a prominent tavern. There were several along that stretch of Main Street. Wouldn't it? It was also called City Tavern, is that? Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, he's there, but he puts his troops at St. John's. They're, they're uh, camping up there. I wish we knew more details. Yeah. My guess is they would have been camped all over. Yeah. Okay. So we can we say, though. Yeah. We just don't know specifics of who was where and, and that kind they of were, thing. Well, they were all over 2,000. Now I think about a two, 1,500, 2,000 troops all over that small concentrated area of Richmond. And when we're talking about the old stone house, for those who don't know it, that's where the Poe Museum is now. So that, that's, a, that's a good frame of reference for it. So the, the citizens of Richmond, all 600 of them, have most of them like hightailed it or are they hunkering down? What's the, paint a picture of that? I don't think the sources that we, we have really say. 
probably some of them fled if they could have, if they had the means to. Probably a lot of them had no ability to do that and stayed. They don't know how long this is going to last. And, and actually, the occupation only lasts for 24 hours. Yeah, I was about to say, it was real quick. And yeah. was, any, was anybody killed in the skirmish, or was it just a... The I accounts mean, don't say. Okay. Did Arnold have any prisoners that he, uh, you know, held at St. John's or anywhere else? Or was it just nobody knows? Not, not that I know of. Yeah. And there could be more research done on that. It, it would be time consuming and you know, something I'd, I'd love to do someday. <laughs> So in this, this concentrated 24 hour period, here comes Benedict Arnold, he's, you know, they're, they're going to the um, foundry and then they're burning all this. Stuff. Well, actually, when does the burning start? That's my question. And what okay, do so the, next, the next morning, uh, the British forage and look for military supplies. Uh, th there were some warehouses along the waterfront and in the, the Fulton, uh, neighborhood near Rockets Landing. Rockets Landing was the, the city wharf. Mm -hmm. And there was a rope walk. A rope walk is a, an area where you, you stretch out the material to make rope. And, and rope is a critical material for not only the Navy, but for the military in general. So uh, that's destroyed. They don't burn the whole town down. They don't, they don't it certainly doesn't seem like, you know, they destroy civilian property randomly right well thank god we still have saint john's church so you know exactly. people, tell me more about what happens then where does he go next well that afternoon uh arnold departs and his troops march back the way they came down what's now route five and they will uh, return to westham they do uh capture a lot of slaves along the way uh, they're looking for property of rebels and that's one way to, to economically hurt them. And they will reboard their transport ships and sail back down. Mm. And, and do any of our troops regroup and go after them? Some of the local American militia will. There'll be a skirmish in Charles City, uh, near Charles City Courthouse. It's a small affair. But uh, the raid is, is clearly a success. It's lightning quick. It demonstrates the vulnerability of the, the new capital. It demonstrates Virginia's inability to defend itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I see it as a sign of how things are gonna escalate because there hadn't been many events for several years. The war had left Virginia uh, and now we've got British troops permanently stationed here. We're gonna have raids and fighting. And obviously later on that spring, the main British army under Cornwallis will arrive and, and things will escalate from there. So what's the fallout for our Governor uh, Jefferson at that point? It, it's really a, a stain on his uh, term as governor. He never really recovers from that. And I, I don't know that blaming him is justified. I mean, perhaps he could have done more. I think he had limited resources. Uh, he certainly worked hard. I mean, he was in the saddle till midnight uh, mm -hmm. the day before the British arrived, trying to oversee the movement of supplies and coordinate things. Uh, perhaps more could have been done sooner, knowing that the, the British are on their way up the river. But uh, Jefferson will finish his term. Uh, his term was almost over as governor. But, but this will be something that haunts him. So is there a lesson we can learn from Arnold's raid? I think just looking at the, the significance of it in terms of uh, what's happening during the revolution and uh, Virginia is starting to become a, a theater of operation and starting to become a focal point for both, both sides. And the events will escalate here. You know, lessons learned, you know, Virginia had to, depleted a lot of its resources. It wasn't really well prepared for anything like this. And that will continue to be a problem when, when the armies arrive and things lead to the Yorktown campaign. Uh, Virginia's hard pressed to support the, the effort. Um, the British are able to march all over the state pretty much at will that whole summer. So what, where, does, uh, where does Arnold go next? What's the next, where is he after this? Well, 
something interesting about Arnold and this mission, which I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, the British never really trust him. I mean, obviously, he switched sides once. Um, you know, how much can we, faith can we put in this person? The, the expedition had a, an officer under Arnold called uh, John Simcoe, British officer, and he has what was called a dormant commission. And it basically said that if Arnold does anything wrong, if Arnold does anything questionable, you have the ability to take over and arrest him. Arnold doesn't know this. It's supposed to be a secret. It is a secret. But Arnold will return back to Portsmouth. And through the, the spring, they'll do some other small raids. More British troops arrive. Uh, they'll seize Petersburg. And um, the commander of those troops, General William Phillips, dies. He's buried in Blandford Cemetery there in Petersburg. And Arnold, again, finds himself in command of British troops in Virginia, but only temporarily. Later on, Cornwallis will arrive, and then he becomes the senior officer. And at that point, Arnold feels that he is um, not getting, I guess, I don't say the glory that he wants out of this, this expedition, but he's not getting um, the accolades and the attention that, that he wants. So he asks to be transferred back to New York, and that's done. And he will finish up the war in New York City, which the British hold until the war is over, and they evacuate in 1783. Arnold will move to England, and... Uh, struggles financially. Again, uh, he's seen as a second-class citizen. I mean, he, he is an American, and so the British look down on him, even though he switched sides to their side. Uh, he never really enjoys the, the trust or the confidence of English society. Um, how important was Richmond during the Rev War? It was a small town. Uh, it had it had some industry. The Western Iron Works was obviously important. Its position on the river, the rope walks, some other naval industry down there around Rockets Landing is important. It's along, it's along I-95. Yeah. So the predecessor, would, you know, that was a major north-south road for supplies and material moving down to the Carolinas, especially as the war heats up down there. Okay, so for everybody, um, who wants to further their education about the Rev War in Richmond, uh, Bert gets major props and the, the Richmond American Revolution um, Roundtable of Richmond gets uh, props for this as well. They have collaborated and created this wonderful brochure map um, on all things Revolutionary War in Richmond. You can download it from the Richmond Revolutionary Roundtable website. Okay. So go to the website, American Revolution Roundtable Richmond, and you can search for the Revolution, Richmond and the Revolution brochure. And you're right, this is something you can do now. Uh, a lot of the sites that we've identified are sites. They're not necessarily historic museums or, or houses to visit. The, the places where something happened or something was. So you can take this and drive around and explore the city's revolutionary history. And again, we did this because it is an ignored period. It's, it's overshadowed by the other conflict. And there are some pretty significant things here in Richmond to see and learn about. So I hope everyone does that. And I'll also throw out that the, the American Revolution Roundtable of Richmond is, uh, I like to think, a fun group that meets. We talk about the revolution. We have authors. We do field trips. Right now, we're not able to meet, but under normal conditions, we need meet at the University of Richmond in the dining hall, and you can learn all about that on the website, too. I really would encourage everybody to check that out, and it is a fun group. So, a plug for your wonderful work with this uh, at, uh, brochure, and as soon as sites are open again, I hope people take advantage of it. Um, there's so much to, to learn about in Richmond and history is everywhere here. So thank you so much, Bert. 
for your time today. Thank you for having me. It was fun.